now we're getting into the really fun topics. Let's talk about hemodynamics. I know I'm excited. I hope you are too. So let's start by talking about what are hemodynamics. So hemodynamics are um, a bunch of numbers that look really scary to nursing school students, but <laughs> effectively what they really are, are just measures of pressure flow and oxygenation of the client. And it can tell me how well my heart is pumping. Do I have too much fluid or maybe not enough fluid? And how much output or blood is coming out of my heart? And this is just a few things. It can tell you a lot more. It can tell you about what's going on in the blood vessels. Um, it can tell you how well you're oxygenating. There's so much hemodynamics can tell you. So let's kind of review the, you know, the big guns of, um, you know, some of the, the measures of um, hemodynamics. So probably the one that most people think of most commonly is going to be cardiac output. And what is cardiac output? It's a fancy name for the amount of volume of blood that's pumped out by the heart in one minute's time. And of course, because you guys love it, there's an equation for cardiac output. So cardiac output is the um, stroke volume times the heart rate. So that seems pretty simple, right? Yeah, except there's a lot of things that um, can affect cardiac output. So let's kind of do a little review about what can affect the cardiac output. So well, first is the heart rate. So if you watched any of the EKG videos, you remember that if the heart rate is too fast or too slow, my cardiac output or my perfusion is not going to be as good. I need to be beating fast enough where I'm able to get, you know, actual blood out to the rest of the body, but if I'm pumping too fast, then I'm not going to have time to fill, so I'm not going to have that same volume that I need to pump out to the rest of the body. So having a normal heart rate is uh, definitely very important. The other factor that I have to consider is stroke volume. And stroke volume, again, it's in the name, is the volume of blood that I'm allowed to get out. So it really, at the end of the day, if you're thinking of cardiac output, it's how fast you're beating times how much volume you're able to get out. Um, and so um, at the end of the day, stroke volume has a lot of factors that can affect it. So um, of course, there's going to be things like contractility, how well my heart can squeeze, how's my muscle doing? If, I'm, if my muscle of my heart's not pumping well, um, it doesn't matter how fast or slow my heart's beating, it doesn't matter how much volume I have in the heart, if I can't squeeze, I'm not going to have good cardiac output. Other things that can affect is how much volume. So volume, we're gonna talk about this, volume equals stretch. You know, if I don't have any fluid in my tank, I have nothing to put out. I have to have so much volume in order to get fluid moving forward. Um, or sorry, to, to get anything moving forward. If I don't have fluid, I don't have fluid. Um, so, you know, my preload or how much volume I have on my body is also gonna be a factor. My volume of blood I can pump out in one minute is gonna be low if I don't have a lot of volume. Um, we talk about, um, you know, when we talk about preload, we're going to talk about Frank Starling's law, which is effectively the, the more volume I have, the more contraction I have. And um, it'll make more sense when I give kind of the analogy when we go over that. Um, the other factor that we have to consider is what's going on in the blood vessels. So let's say even everything in my heart's going well. My heart's pumping well. It's got a great muscle. It can squeeze. My heart rate is normal. I have plenty of volume. But what happens if my heart's doing its job, but my blood vessels are really, really, really tiny and narrow? Well, then I have to overcome so much resistance. And this is what the heart has to do. And, you know, feel sorry for the heart. The poor thing is trying to do its job. And those darn blood vessels, they're so narrow. There's so much resistance. And that's what we call afterload. It's after the heart. And so when we talk about afterload, we're talking about the amount of resistance the heart has to overcome to pump blood forward. So even if everything else is great. Um, you know, I cannot get good blood flow out if my, my heart has to overcome so much resistance. So I always think of that analogy. Um, and if you were, uh, you know, in my class in person, you might have actually seen me do this, um, where, uh, you know, I take a, uh, you know, like a big jug of water or milk, and I pour it into two different funnels. So um, if I have, you know, good volume, like I got a big old jug of water or milk, and I'm pouring it into a funnel, if it's a tiny, tiny, tiny funnel, it's going to go, the, the milk's going to go in there, the water's going to go in there, but it's going to go slower. I'm not going to have a lot of out very quickly. It's going to take a while to get that whole jug of milk through that funnel. But if I have a big old dilated blood vessel, not even dilated, but just even normal blood vessel, then I can put, there's no resistance there. It doesn't have to fight against that resistance. That's effectively what we're looking at is that like, um, how hard is it going to be for your heart to push that blood forward? Because what is it, what is it up against? You know, how much resistance is it fighting? So um, with hemodynamics, yes, you do have to know these numbers. Um, the normal cardiac output is going to be from four to eight liters. The higher the number, the higher the output. 
Um, and so when we're thinking about cardiac output, what happens when it gets high or low? We don't really worry about high cardiac output. That's great. I mean, your, cardi your heart's putting out lots of blood. We usually don't talk too much about that. Um, what we worry about is when it gets low, because if my cardiac output's low, that means my blood pressure's low. That means my perfusion's low. And if I'm not getting blood out, if I'm not um, perfusing my um, organs, because I'm not getting oxygen out, because what is, what's the whole point of getting blood out of my heart? It's not just for volume. I need that oxygen that's in that blood. Um, so if my cardiac output is too low, I need more heart squeeze to get blood out. So I need something to help contract my heart to help push it out, or I need to treat, of course, whatever the problem is. But, um, you know, a lot, most of the time when I have a low cardiac output, um, you know, it's because my heart's not doing its job. It's not pumping the way it's supposed to. No offense, heart, but it's just because, you know, something's going on. So I need something like a positive inotrope that's going to help to pump that blood forward. So there's also preload. And like I mentioned, preload is all about volume. And I mentioned this whole thing, the greater the volume, the greater the stretch. So think of a slingshot. The more you pull back a slingshot, the more force that it has. And it's the same with preload. The more volume that goes into my heart, the more squeeze that I have. There is a certain point where, you know, especially like with a slingshot too, you can only pull it back so far. And eventually, even if you pull it back very far, it's not going to, um, you know, you know, whatever, if you're trying to throw a rock or whatever with a slingshot, um, it's not going to have that same long distance. But um, as a whole, um, think of it this way, that I have to have so much volume on board because the, the greater the volume that I have, the greater the squeeze of the heart to push it out. It's going to have a greater strength of contractility. Um, the normal values for this, and um, I have a couple here because we can look at the um, preload or the amount of volume on the right side of the heart, and we can look at the amount of volume on the left side of the heart. On the right side of the heart, it's called the right atrial pressure, CVP is what most people know it is. And your book says this is two to eight. And I've got to tell you, you might see some different numbers. You know, if you Google this, you know, most of the time in my career, it's like, six to 10 or six to 12, but, um, you know, um, you know, your book says two to eight and that's what we go by for testing purposes. So, um, at the, unless your professor told you differently. Um, and so at the end of the day, um, you know, that's, what's telling me how much volume do I have? So if those numbers, that number is low, that means my tank is empty. I'm dehydrated. I have no volume or not enough volume to help to get cardiac output. If that number is high, then I am overloaded. I have too much fluid on board. Um, there's also the PAD and PAWP, and this is the pulmonary artery diastolic or the pulmonary artery wedge pressure. And both of these tell you how the left side of your heart is doing when it comes to volume. And you can see these, these um, regular values are actually really close. These are measuring two different, um, two very similar things, and it, uh, they're, they're measuring the same thing, really. Um, but, um, you know, effectively, um, again, it's the same thing. If these numbers are low, I'm dehydrated. If these numbers are high, I am overloaded. So I'm gonna treat it if it's high or low. So if I have too much preload, um, you know, which of course that's gonna to be too much fluid, I'm gonna be fluid overloaded. I'm not gonna be able to breathe and my heart is gonna get overwhelmed. So if I have too much fluid, I need things like diuretics to help get that fluid off. Now on the opposite end, if I have not enough preload, my number's low, I have a low CVP or a low PAD or a low PAWP, that's not enough fluid. I am dehydrated. And if I'm dehydrated again, I don't have any volume to go out to the rest of the body. So in that case, I need fluid. Or sometimes, you know, it's a patient if they're bleeding or something, they may need blood. Mm -hmm. So then we talked about afterload. Afterload is about the resistance in the blood vessel. So this is nothing to do with the heart. This all has to do with the resistance in the blood vessels. How open are they to receive all that beautiful blood the heart is trying to give? So I had a student one semester that remembered SVR because it's the squeeze vessel resistance. Um, and, um, you know, the um, normal um, squeeze vessel resistance or SVR is 800 to 1200. Now there is a normal number for the right side of the heart, but I got to be honest, we never really look at that. We really care about what is the resistance that the um, heart has to overcome to pump blood to the rest of the body. Um, you may, if you work in certain, um, you know, specialties and things like that, have to learn about the pulmonary um, vas uh, vascular resistance, but um, we really focus on the um, SVR, which is the systemic vascular resistance. Um, so I want to know what's going on in my system. How constricted is it? How, um, is it open and dilated or is it closed, constricted, a lot of resistance? So again, like it says here, if these numbers are high, 
my vessels are clamped. I'm vasoconstricted. There's gonna, the heart's gonna have to work really, really hard and fight against a lot of resistance to get blood forward. If these numbers are low, then my vessels are open or dilated. Now people get this commonly mixed up because they, they look at it backwards. So if I have a high SVR, I have high resistance. If I have a low SVR, I have low resistance. So high vasoconstricted, high um, resistance, low, low resistance, vasodilation. So how am I gonna treat this? Um, if I have too much afterload, and remember, that's the high numbers, too much squeeze, too much resistance, I'm vasoconstricted, um, it's going to be hard to get blood out to the rest of the body. I need to give things that are going to open up those blood vessels, decrease that resistance. So I'm going to give things like vasodilators. If I have not enough to afterload, maybe I'm very, I'm already very vasodilated. There's no resistance, which may seem like a good thing. Keep in mind, I need some sort of resistance to get blood moving forward. So um, when I'm too vasodilated, blood pools and blood doesn't get back to the heart. So I need some squeeze. So if my numbers are too low, so if my SBR is low, less than 800, um, what do you call it? And um, uh, you know, um, I'm pretty much in a very a big state of vasodilation. Then I need some squeeze. I need more constriction. So I need vasopressors. Another hemodynamic you might want to consider is the mean arterial pressure. And I actually have a other another video about this. So if you haven't watched that and you want to re, uh, learn more about this or how to calculate this, feel free. So a mean arterial pressure tells us about the average blood pressure. And the formula for it is it's the systolic blood pressure plus two times the diastolic divided by three. And this is an average blood pressure. I have average blood pressure twice. <laughs> so in case you didn't realize, it is an average blood pressure. <laughs> and so uh, greater than 65 is gonna be considered good kidney perfusion. Um, if these numbers are high, then there's too much pressure hypertension. If these numbers are low, and there is not enough pressure or hypotension. And what are we gonna do? If my blood pressure is too high, like hypertension, I can have a stroke, heart attack, it can lead to a lot of problems. Too much pressure is not what I need. Uh, and so too much pressure, I'm gonna give antihypertensives or give vasodilators to decrease some of that pressure. There's too much pressure in the blood vessels, I can give things to open them up or decrease the pressure there, decrease that constriction that's going on. Um, if I have a low MAP, I have not enough pressure, so hypotension. There's no blood flow, no perfusion, or not no, but there's low blood flow, low perfusion, and it can lead to organ and tissue death. So if I have not enough pressure, it depends on what I'm missing. I'm always going to start, and we're going to talk about this concept, you always give fluids first, fluids first, then pressors. Um, but that's usually where I'm going to start, of course, depending on why is their blood pressure low. So there's a couple different monitoring devices. We can put in devices like arterial lines, central lines, pulmonary artery catheters, things like that to uh, measure some of these things. Because other, like I've been talking about all these things like preload and SVR and cardiac output, but how do we actually know what a patient's thing is? Luckily, it's not something you have to assess for. Like you can assess for some of these things just by looking at a patient, what's their signs of perfusion, but we're going to have devices placed in these patients. So if I get put an arterial line in the patient, I can hook them up to a cardiac output monitor and see what their continuous blood pressure is. Every second, their blood pressure changes. So I can see if there's any major changes. And I can also see what their cardiac output is. On the other side of things, I can also um, uh, get a central line and see what a patient's CVP is. In other words, what their central venous pressure or that preload is. Because central lines, they end right at the beginning of the heart. And remember, that's where we check for CVP or right atrial pressure to see what is the amount of fluid coming back to the heart after it goes throughout the entire body. Um, then I also can get a pulmonary artery catheter. And these usually, we put these in in patients that have really bad heart failure, but most of the time you're only going to see them in patients right after open heart surgery. Um, and um, this can tell me the left side heart, what the pressures are there, what their SVR is, or that um, systemic vascular resistance, how much resistance is in the blood vessels. It can also tell me what my CVP is. So um, obviously, and there's there's uh, more that all these lines can do, but just to kind of give you an idea of what some of these lines can do. My, my role as the nurse in these are to maintain the catheter itself and the dressings. I need to assess for complications. 
it's my job to be looking for things like these are something that's not them that's inserted in them. So I need to be looking for infection. Um, a lot of these are inserted in or around the heart. So it can cause dysrhythmias um, and uh, lead to some serious problems with that. So I need to keep a close eye and make sure that, um, you know, the, uh, the catheter itself doesn't get dislodged and it's in the right place. Um, and then also alter perfusion, especially with an arterial line, um, that can actually occlude your radial artery. And so you have to do an Allen's test before you insert, um, you know, uh, an arterial line or stick someone in their artery. Um, and um, you always need to be checking their hand and making sure that it's getting um, adequate perfusion. There's not a blockage there. We also want to, I swear, my gosh, I swear this is my, one of my favorite topics, right? I know it's yours too. Um, one of the other things we need to do is check for appropriate positions. So like a lot of these um, catheters, especially the, uh, the pulmonary artery catheter, it actually has markings on it to know that it's in the right place. Um, and so I need to check every shift and make sure that it's staying in the right place. But I always need to look at the insertion side of all of these and make sure that it's in the way that it's supposed to. Um, also, these all these are attached to a pressure bag, um, so I need to check that that pressure bag is patent every shift. Um, I'm also going to um, change the tubing when it needs to that goes to this line that allows me to keep these pressure readings. Like at my hospital, we change it weekly. Um, I'm also going to flush it and zero it. So I'm going to make sure that this line is working every shift and we um, zero it to the phlebostatic access. And so like the nurse is doing in this picture, it's really like at the bottom tip of that heart, I'm going to um, get the, there's like a little, um, uh, what do you call it, um, lever on the uh, line itself. Like you can see here kind of in this picture, this white thing and then the, the plastic tubing, I'm zeroing um, their heart to the same level as, um, you know, that tubing. Now, I should say that I'm, I'm moving the thing on the pole up and down so that it's level with that patient's phlebostatic access. access. And something else I'll just bring up is we always want to make sure that we're not just looking at the device, that we're also looking at the patient. Um, the patient uh, and the showing signs, like I can sit there and be like, oh, well, their map is this, their cardiac output's this, their CVP is this. But I need to look at that patient. Are they showing signs that this is congruent? Because remember, you know, these devices aren't perfect. Um, and so are they really showing signs that they're fluid overloaded or dehydrated or not getting good perfusion? So I need to be doing very good um, assessments of the patient as well. See, that wasn't that bad. And on to shock and other fun things, but I hope this was helpful to get you started in learning in some of these hemodynamics and learning they're not so scary after all. I'll see you next time.